He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me. He made everything new. Victory's been won, and I'm walking in the light of that new Jerusalem, and I'm walking in the light of that new Jerusalem. If you just 
stand with me this evening? Well, thank you, Jesus, for the things that you have brought me through. Though I can't repay with all my heart, I'd like to say that I thank you.
us bow our heads together and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for bringing us here, Lord, by your grace. God, you've been watchful over us and you've drawn us to yourself once again that we might come together to worship your name. Lord, how we long. God, we want to express our love to you and our gratitude for all you've done for us. God, we pray you would be pleased with our worship, with our praise, with the desire of our heart, that you would abide in the praises of your people. God, we've come to hear from you, Lord, that you might break the bread of life for us. We pray, God, that you would come on the scene now and take this vessel of clay and use it for your glory. May I be able to get out of the way, and Lord, may you take control. May you deliver your word to your waiting children. We give you preeminence. We ask that you take your liberty among us. Lord, direct us, teach us, correct us, guide us by your word. We love you. Take preeminence among us, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Good evening. It's good to be here together. While we're standing, let's grab our Bibles and let's read a scripture before we're seated. We want to read out of Proverbs chapter 18. While you're turning there, I just want to remind you that Brother Vitaly and his family will be coming in this weekend. They actually arrive uh, in Columbus tomorrow evening, so we'll be picking them up there, and uh, they'll be taking the Sunday morning service here, and then the afternoon service for the youth, so we're looking forward to having them here for that. Also, I want to remind you that Brother Kyle Weikert will be leaving Friday. He'll be flying out to Oregon for services there, Brother Rich Com, and he'll be coming back, I think, Monday or Tuesday. So just be praying for him, and Brother Wesley will be with him. And also, don't forget Brother Emmanuel. He's still gone. still be gone for another two weeks, I believe. So remember, keep him in prayer. He sent me a text. Let me know that he had one day he wasn't feeling too well, but the Lord took care of him, and he's feeling much better. So just pray for our brother to have strength. Amen doing a lot of ministering, a lot of interpreting, a lot of traveling, and it has a way of wearing you down. So just pray that he'll stay strong. Amen. Let's look together here at Proverbs 18, 24. Proverbs 18, verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And God bless you as you have your seats. Amen. It's a little bit of an odd scripture to take, but God dropped this thought in my heart, and I haven't been able to get away from it. And the only way to get away from it is to preach it. Amen. And there's a scripture that I read that's going to be the main thrust that I want to launch off of out of 2 Samuel. We can go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 10. But I just want to share with you that, um, oh, it's probably been a couple months ago I read through this, and it just struck me. And Every once in a while, you read something out of the scripture that strikes you, and and for me, I know that there's a sermon there. I know there's something there that's drawing my attention, but I don't know yet how it'll materialize. So that was a few months ago. And then just over the last several weeks, it began to materialize in my heart. And so now I just want to share it with you. But I want to take for a title, Don't Make Friends Into Enemies. Don't Make Friends Into Enemies. And for a subtitle, I want to put uh, Preserving Relationships. So don't make friends into enemies and preserving relationships. Amen? And that's why I was just dwelling on this because this is not, not my usual mode of operation, but God dropped it in my heart so solid I knew what to minister. Amen? So we're going to go down this line. Once we read 2 Samuel, begin to see what we're referring to. 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent, comfort, sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father? that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Wherefore, Hanun took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle even to their buttocks and sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to, them, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. 
Amen. So, like I said, I was just reading this through my daily, my daily reading, my daily Bible reading, and it struck me, and I knew there was something here, so I, I started thinking about it, meditating on it, and it just came back. And you begin to realize that, that there's a great lesson here. It's a simple lesson, but it's a great lesson. Here David wants to show kindness. David is going to show himself a friend to this neighboring country, to the country of Ammon. And because this man's father showed kindness to David, David's going to show kindness to him and sends an ambassador, sends some ambassadors that way to comfort him for his father and his extension of friendship. Amen. But they were suspicious of David. They didn't accept him as a friend. They were suspicious, and, and the princes of that country began to speak to the king and made him misunderstand David's act of kindness. Made him misunderstand it, uh, made him suspicious, amen, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, the fear began to creep in that David wasn't genuine, this is not a genuine show of friendship, and now, because fear creeps in, this old self rises up, and now there's an act of self-preservation that's going to take place based off suspicion, based off all of these things, and all of it is a mirage, all of it's false, all of it's fake, David is being genuine. So what he does is he, he shames the ambassadors and he sends them away ashamed and they're greatly ashamed and what he did was a terrible offense to the men. And David, uh, David then tells them to wait at Jericho and then the story goes on, we won't read all of it, but the story goes on and when they realize that they had offended David, then they call up the Syrians because they know David's gonna fight so now they call for enemies and they're starting a battle before a battle started. David come as a friend, and they didn't accept him as a friend, but saw him as an enemy, but he was coming as a friend. That's why I said don't make friends into enemies. David would have been the best friend they ever had. They, David was a man after God's own heart. He was a mighty king and a mighty warrior. If they would have received his friendship, if they would have acknowledged his friend, and they would have been friendly unto him, he would have been the best friend they ever had. But because they were suspicious, amen, because they had pride, because they had fear. Fear and pride brought out a self-preservation and brought out suspicion and brought out all of this out of, their, out of their hearts, amen, and they did the very wrong thing. And then after they realized they had greatly offended David, now instead of repenting and making it right, they go and get the Syrians to come and become an army to stand with them. And when David finds out they've called on the Syrians, then he sends Joab in the battle. There's a great battle and it eventually ends with Ammon being destroyed the king losing his kingdom, them taking the crown and putting it on David's head. And none of it needed to happen. All because they didn't receive a friend as a friend, but they allowed the devil to interpret his friendship as an enemy. Oh man, what a lesson, friends. Like I said, this is simple. Hey Amen. don't wait me to, for me to get to the punchline. You've already got it. It's so simple, you can read it and understand how many times have we done the same thing, amen? All the time we take a notion from a friend or, or we take a compliment and we can take a compliment through the devil interpretation and we can turn a compliment into a, a suspicious statement. What did they mean by that statement? Why did they say it that way? Why did he say it? Why did they say it with that tone? And all of a sudden we begin to become suspicious of our friends. I say, God, help us. Help us, everyone. Amen. We find that in the Bible, friendship is a very important theme. Very important. Jesus was the greatest friend the disciples ever had. He called them his friend. Friendship shows up from the beginning to the end. We find David and Jonathan were friends, bosom friends, so much friends that the love for one another was greater than a love for a man for a woman. Amen, and they stuck with one another, they defended one another, they protected and trusted one another. Friendship is a tremendous theme in the Bible, and here we find a case of friendship turned, they, they made an enemy out of David when it didn't need to be that way. And I think that most of the time, the things that happen to us don't need to happen the way they do. We, we many times turn brothers and sisters into enemies. Has that ever happened to you? By being suspicious. Why did they do that? Why didn't they include me in this? Why did they make that statement? Why did they go there? Why? Last time they called me, this time they didn't call me. I was invited there last time, but I'm not invited there this time. I said it's simple. I mean, 
We're, we're so fallen as human beings, it's embarrassing. It's shameful. Sometimes I just look to God and I say, God, I'm ashamed of being in this hybrid flesh. I'm ashamed of where my mind goes. I'm ashamed of where my emotions go. I sometimes ashamed of myself. I tell you what's so tragic. Sometimes the best friend you have in the whole world, your spouse, the devil will make you suspicious of your spouse. You'll be suspicious of their motives. Why did they say that? And why, why when I said this, they said that? And why when I asked them to do this, they didn't do that? What's the devil trying to do? He's trying to come down and make enemies about, out of the best friend you have in the whole world, which is your spouse. And, and we all know what that's like, amen? The enemy's constantly trying to find a way in to break friendship, to break relationship. That's why the, that's why the subtitle is Preserving Relationships, and we're going to get into that. But the devil will make us, make us suspicious, and that suspicion always comes from fear and pride. Fear and pride. And we're going to find out that the best way to stay a friend and the best way to preserve a relationship is we've got to die out to ourselves and stop this notion of self-preservation, stop this notion of protecting ourselves and having to prevent harm from coming to us. Amen. The only way to be a true friend, amen, the only way to preserve a relationship is to become absolutely vulnerable and open to total destruction from the ones you love. Say, so is that right, Brother Ted? That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Let's look at this in John chapter 6. I'm finding more and more as God begins to deal deeper and deeper in my own heart, I, feel, I find more and more that uh, all of my problems come from myself. that it's not always what happens around me, it's how I interpret what's happening around me. And many times I have a false interpretation of what's happening, and the false interpretation is coming out of self-love, coming out of pride, amen, and, 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 and a fear that I'm going to lose something. I'm going to lose a friend, I'm going to lose status, I'm going to lose reputation, and then all of a sudden I go into countermeasures to try to counteract the loss of a reputation or the loss of friendship or a loss of status, amen? And when I do that, I moved into self-preservation, but now in order to preserve myself, it causes me to go on a counteroffensive, And all of a sudden, you can have war break out. Amen? And sometimes it's not open conflict. Sometimes it's cold war. It's a silent war. It's an estrangement from friends. And you become distant and become cold. Amen? And the, the cold war enters in all because, amen, of old, rotten, dirty, stinking self. And that old pride that was injected at the fall, amen, that we all have to deal with, amen, that's Lucifer's pride. This comes straight from, this comes straight from Lucifer, got injected into humanity through the fall, and we're all struggling with it. But what we need is a good, healthy dose of dying to self. And like one brother told me, he says, sometimes you don't even know what you're supposed to die from. I mean, you want to die to yourself, so I died to myself when I come to the message and I threw my shorts away. And I cut the cable to the TV, and, and I died to myself because I love TV. And I mean, I was raised a latchkey kid. I watched four to six hours of TV every day of my life. I mean, I loved it. I, I watched it. I watched it when I didn't want to watch it. I watched it when I was tired of watching it, but I watched it anyways. So when I cut it out, I was dying to self. When I cut some old places and I surrendered, amen, but you realize that this dying out to self, amen, it's not going to be that simple. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. And so we, we begin to find that, Brother Bram said, the greatest enemy I got is William Branham. Well, I'm telling you, the greatest enemy I got is Chad Lamb, this old hybrid flesh with this carnal spirit, amen, and this, this notion of I have to protect myself, and I, I've got to drop that notion if I'm ever going to get anywhere in the kingdom of God. If I'm going to be like Christ, I have to drop self-preservation. i got to get rid of it. I gotta stop all this suspicious. You know what I'm talking about because you're a human being. The very ones you love the most. Sometimes family members become suspicious of one another. Why did they do that? And why did they say that? And you know, 
They, they got in the fridge and they ate the last piece of cake and they knew that I wanted it. They just did that to spite me. And then all of a sudden, it builds up a wall. And then we go into Cold War and it sounds funny, but that's the harmless end of it. But you take that a couple other notches into a brother and sister or, or to family members or to spouses, you, you extend it from one church to another, and all of a sudden you got open cold war for no reason whatsoever other than the war that's going on in our mind trying to preserve ourselves and our reputation and not to allow ourselves to get hurt. But it's not the example Jesus Christ gave us, and it's not the example the prophet in this age gave us. We go to John chapter 6 and look at verse 70. We're going to look at the relationship between Jesus and Judas for a moment. And Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. I want you to look where we're at in the book of John. We're in John chapter 6, all the way in the beginning. We're in the earlier parts of Jesus' ministry. We haven't even come to the end yet. And he already knows that one of the ones that he's chosen is a devil, and he knows it's Judas Iscariot. Amen. John, John discloses that here in the Bible. Amen. But you never find anywhere where Jesus discredits Judas as a friend. He calls him friend. In fact, Jesus knows what's in the heart of Judas, and he knows that he's a thief. Yeah. He knows he has the heart of the thief. So what does Jesus do to Judas? He gives him the bag of money because he knows in his heart is a thief. Yeah. And he knows he's the one to betray, betray him. But, you know, if it was me and I knew, if I knew one of you would betray me, amen, I'm going to tell you, it's going to take a whole lot of grace for me to be as good to you as Jesus was to Judas. I'm just being honest. I just, I need to grow. I need more of the Spirit of God to take over, and I need less of me. Because if I know, if I know from the beginning in our relationship that a few years down the road, amen, one of you are going to betray me, and it's going to cause separation from the disciples I love. It's going to cause a painful death. It's going to cause all of that. It's going to be very difficult for me to maintain the kind of friendship for you that Jesus maintained for Judas. But the question is, are we going to be like Jesus or not? Amen. Jesus never came to the earth to preserve his life. You know, when we really get a revelation of who we are, like genuinely catch a revelation of who we are, in the reality, you know, not the emotional workup, not the enthusiasm or excitement of being accepted and being one of them, but really quickened in the soul that you know that you came from God and you go to God, that you know you're part of God, you know you're here to express a portion of the word. Then really it comes down to the point that what does my life matter anyways? What is my reputation worth anyways? I'm only here for 70, 80, 90 years or however space of time he gives me and then I will go on to my eternal reward. Amen. I've come to the place now, amen, in, in my life that the sixth dimension or the marriage supper, whichever one I get to first, amen, is so glorious to me that I have no problem dropping this life to move to the next one. And I couldn't have always said that because I had such a desire for things in this life, experiences I wanted to have. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have children. I wanted to experience these things. But the more that I live in this hybrid flesh and the more I realize how wrong it is. The thought of leaving this flesh is not a terrorizing thought. It's a glorious thought. It's a happy thought. Amen. When we know where we're going. So if we know we've been dropped into this earth on assignment by purpose and will of God, on assignment to accomplish something for his purpose, then if I get spit on, so what? If I get rejected, so what? If, if, uh, if everybody turns from me, so what? I'm here to accomplish his purpose, to manifest his will, and then to go on back to where I came from. Brother Branham said this time is just a little hickey on the circle of eternity. Amen. And it'll be sucked right back into eternity one day when God accomplishes what he wants to accomplish. I came from eternity. I'm going back to eternity. My whole existence is for eternity. I'm only here playing a part. 
and I want to play that part faithfully, and I never came here to preserve my life like Jesus never came here to preserve his life. I came here to surrender my life, amen, but I've been given free choice in this dimension, in this area of time, in this vessel of clay. I've been given free choice so that I could choose to lay down my life and let him have full control. And so we must lose the notion of self-preservation. We must keep dying continually to pride. We must not let fear be our motivation. I cannot count to you how many horrible decisions I've made because I was afraid. I was afraid of what people would think. I was afraid of what would happen if I don't move quickly. I was afraid. I, I can't tell you how many decisions I made based off fear. And many times, it was fear I would look bad, I would lose out, I would fail. If you see, all those things keep pointing back to one thing, me. Make a horrible financial decision because if I don't jump on this now, I'll lose the opportunity. Why? So I could gain something financially. My fear was I would lose. My fear was my reputation would suffer. My fear was an opportunity would pass me by. My fear was people would think bad of me. And many of those decisions were disastrous. Some in major ways, some in minor ways. But that's not the choice love makes. Love makes a different choice. And we saw that in the life of Jesus Christ. Let's look at John 13. John 13 and 10. This is John 13 we read every time we have feet washing once a month. And after Jesus washed their feet, in verse 10 he says, he uh, Jesus said to them, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. This is, he hasn't washed them yet. This is before he washes them. He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So he knew, about this verse 11, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Here we know that Jesus knew they weren't all clean. Jesus knew that one of them was a devil. Jesus Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Jesus knew he had the heart of a thief. Jesus knew when they were were in in the house uh, uh, where Mary came and broke the alabaster box and Judas says this should have been sold and given to the poor. Jesus knew why he said that because he had the heart of a thief. And Jesus didn't call him out. Jesus didn't rebuke him, didn't make him ashamed of himself. Jesus just simply said, the poor you always have. Me, you won't always have. She's anointed me for my burial. But he didn't, he he knew, but he didn't call him out. I wonder how many of us could pass that test. Knowing exactly why a brother's saying something. But instead of shaming him and exposing him, you just cover it over. Telling you, I struggle with these things. Sometimes you know somebody's up to no good, and all you want to do is expose it. But we're going to find out that's not really what we're supposed to do. So Jesus, had, Jesus is about to wash Judas' feet, and I don't believe Jesus washed him any differently than he washed Peter's or John's. I don't believe he treated Judas any differently than he treated anybody else. I believe he treated them all the same, so much so they said, one of you, amen, one of you shall betray me. And they all said, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? It wasn't that he had been given the cold shoulder to Judas all week long. It wasn't that, I mean, he barely washed his feet and moved on. They had no clue who it was. Even when Jesus sent him away, they assumed he went away on an errand to do something for Jesus. They never assumed that it was he. This is how Jesus treated his enemy. He treated his enemy as a friend. You know, Billy Paul said in his testimony, he said one amazing thing about Brother Benham, he says you couldn't tell his enemies from his friends. 
I say, God, help me. I've got to grow. I have to grow. But, but the purpose of preaching is so we know what we're, what we're seeking after, what we need, what we're praying for, saying, God, I need victory in this. Help me with this. I need to die to myself. I need to love everyone as a friend. Let's go over to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And I'd like to read verse 47. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're coming. Judas is leading a band to arrest Jesus. In verse 47, he says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves from chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Jesus, at the point of betrayal, calls Judas his friend. Never called him an enemy, called him a friend. He said, friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. I just marvel at this. This is our example. No matter how hard it seems or how impossible, but you know what? I don't believe it's impossible. I absolutely do not stand here today and believe that this is impossible. I believe this is the age where it's become possible. I believe this is the generation, amen, that'll have the manifestation of the life of Jesus Christ. I believe that's why God sent a prophet and he restored the word because when the word came back, the life of that word came back. And if the full measure of the word is back, amen, then the full life of that word is back here in the bride to bring about the full manifestation of the life of Jesus Christ. I, I look at this and I find myself short. I, I'm short in many areas. I'm falling short of these things in many ways, but I'm not discouraged. I'm encouraged because the word is here that will bring me all the way to the full manifestation that God wants out of my life. Luther had partial word. He had partial life. Wesley had partial word, had partial life. But we're not in the day of partial word, and I'm not, I'm not settling for partial life, but I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus because I believe this is the hour, and God sent a word and sent his spirit to bring that word to, to life. And that's what I'm depending on. I'm not depending on doing better. Amen, I've tried all my life and I've failed, but there's things that are changing in me that is not an effort, it's a life. Amen. The more I recognize and the more I surrender, the more that's exposed and the more I lay down, the more something keeps changing in me and I'm not what I used to be. I hope you're not what you were two, three years ago. I hope you're different than that. See, where we, where we make our huge mistakes is where when we believe that we've come to maturity before we've come to maturity. And we believe that we're just sitting in the church with the revelation of maturity and we're waiting for everybody else to catch up so we can all go home. That's where we make a huge mistake sometimes. And sometimes the one who feels they're the most mature is the one who's actually the one who's suffering the most from pride and fear and self-preservation. Sometimes we're blind. We see everything else. Well, I don't say sometimes. In reality, we see everything else, but the thing we miss is ourselves. That's where the greatest blindness is. The greatest blindness in our eyes is when we can't see ourselves. It's amazing. Sometimes the most perfect people I ever meet are surrounded by flawed people. And they know the flaws of everybody else, but they don't realize that everybody else can see theirs. So, praise God. When God begins to reveal them to us one by one, we can say, God, I want to die to that. I want to lay that down. Lord, I'm tired of defending myself. I'm wore out with saving a reputation. I have no reputation. I don't want no reputation. I don't, 
I don't want a reputation because if I have a reputation, then I have to defend a reputation. I'm too tired to defend a reputation. I just want to surrender and let God do whatever he wants to do. And whatever anybody else thinks and whatever conclusion they want to come up with about me and about my life, amen, I want to get to the point. I don't say I'm there yet, but I want to get to the point where that doesn't matter as long as I know he's pleased with me. Then I'm okay. If he's pleased with me, even if everybody else misunderstands and doesn't agree and doesn't lie, as long as I know he's pleased with me, then I want that to be my satisfaction. So we find that Jesus was a model friend. He was a friend to his enemy. So now when Billy Paul says, you couldn't tell my my father's enemies from his friends, I say, praise God, because that, he was emulating Jesus Christ. It didn't start in William Branham. We saw it in Jesus Christ. Not even his disciples could tell his enemy that was among them from his friends, and he knew who it was all along. So it's not that the prophet, it's not like we look at the prophet and say, oh my goodness, I want to have his life. No, he was reflecting the life of Jesus Christ. He was bringing it in our day and showing in fallen flesh that you can have the life that Jesus lived can be on display here. Did that make him perfect? Absolutely not. We saw his mistakes too, but that's part of the perfection. You say, how are the mistakes part of the perfection? Because perfection is full maturity, completeness. Perfection is not sinlessness or flawlessness. Perfection is completeness or maturity. And we saw in the flaws, he was corrected by the Spirit of God and would come back and make it right. That, to me, is perfection. Amen. If he demonstrated flawlessness... Knowing he was sin-born, if he demonstrated flawlessness, then we would recognize there's something fishy. But when we so openly saw his mistakes, but we saw the correction, we saw him make it right, we saw the honesty, we saw, amen, we saw him rebuked, we saw him repentant, we saw all of that. To me, that was a display of perfection. That's a son of God who had come to adoption material. And if it it wasn't just for him, that was for me. God showed that so I would know this is what I'm coming to. Well, I make mistakes, a pile of them. But God, help me repent. Correct me by your spirit. Let me have that humility and that surrender that under rebuke I'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. If we look at Luke, let's go to Luke chapter 22. I just want to say that I pray that I'm never the kind of believer that can pass the doctrinal exam and fail in the life. I don't ever want to be that kind of believer. That I can tell you what was preached and what sermon and what order and what year he preached what, but, I, but the people around me don't even enjoy being around me. Don't want that to be my kind of life. I'd rather people say, you know, I'm not so sure Brother Chad understands it all, but you know what? He sure is a nice brother. He's a good friend. He's loving. He seems genuine. That, that would do me, that would do my heart good. Luke 22, verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Who is this? Peter. Peter. Peter, who was confident. Peter, who loved God. When Jesus said that that you all are going to forsake me, Peter is so sure that he loves the Lord so much he's not going to forsake him. Peter makes this statement. He said, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Peter thought that he loved the Lord, and he did love the Lord. I don't want to take that away from Peter. Peter loved the Lord. 
Peter had a fervent desire and a love for the Lord, amen, and he loved him, but we're going to find out that Peter actually still loved himself more than he loved Jesus. Not that he didn't love him, but there was still too much self mixed in. If we go to Matthew 26, back to where we were, Matthew 26. And 73, we'll go down a little further. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said, Peter, surely, said to Peter, surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. I... I think it's amazing now that Peter, all of a sudden, his world comes crashing down. He, 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 you know, everything goes wrong, contrary to what his thinking was, and he thought that he would stand by the Lord. He thought that he loved the Lord more than he loved everything else in the world. Amen. But when it really came down to the press, he found out that he was willing to forsake the Lord to save his own neck. To preserve his own life, to preserve his own person, he was willing to deny the Lord, and when they didn't believe him, he was willing to add cursings in on top of it. And then when the cock crew, he realized what he had done, and he goes out and he repents, and it's wonderful that Peter is broken now, and we find after this, the Lord comes to Peter, and he restores him. And when we come to see the Lord restoring Peter, amen, he comes to him by the Sea of Tiberias, and we have this whole thing where he says, Peter, does thou love us me more than these? And he repeats it three times, amen, because he denied the Lord thrice. And Jesus never shames Peter. Peter was already ashamed. He doesn't mock him. He doesn't shame him. He doesn't cast him away from his presence. He doesn't say he's not worthy to be a friend. Jesus is the model friend. When Jesus was forsaken, when he was betrayed, when he was forsaken, when they all left him, amen, he never waited for them to come back to him to make it right. He went to them. And he loved them, amen, and he never said anything about, do you know what you did to me, and you know how bad that hurt me, and you know, Jesus didn't do that. You don't find him treating his disciples that way. He comes to them, he reveals himself to them, he instructs them, and he restores Peter back into fellowship with him. When Peter wasn't able to do it, Jesus did it. He was the model friend. And if Peter... Let's say it this way, if Peter had done to me what he did to Jesus, if he had done to you, what would we do? Would we say nothing about it and just say, Peter, you're still my friend. Peter, do you love me? That's what I thought. Do you love me? This is where I want to be, friends. Brother Bram says he's he's going to give us some good instruction. We're going to look now into some quotes and some scriptures where Brother Bram gives us some outstanding instruction. He said, we must love, divinely love one another. Then you don't see your brother's mistake. If he does make a mistake, you never, you look over the top of it and you love him anyhow. See, that's it. Love those that love you, then does not the sinner the same thing, but love those who doesn't love you. That's what shows the spirit of God is in you because he loved you when you were his enemy and he loved you and that spirit's in you. It'll make you love your enemy as you do your friend. This is where it's pretty tough. Jesus, I would say he had every right to be offended at Judas Judas, and he had every right to be offended at Peter, but he he surrendered his life. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. He lowered himself for redemption. Amen. And, and he, never, he never held a grudge. He never shamed anybody. He never scolded him. He never mocked him. He was a friend. It's amazing. Jesus never unfriended Judas. Where do you see in the Bible Jesus ever unfriended Judas? It was Judas who unfriended Jesus, not Jesus who unfriended Judas. He didn't unfriend Peter when Peter failed him. He didn't unfriend unfriend the disciples when the disciples ran away. Amen. It was never him that stopped being a friend. It was always somebody else that stopped being his friend. 
I say, God, help me. That's the attitude I want to have every day of my life. I don't want to go around cutting off relationships and not talking to you anymore, not being a friend and giving you the cold shoulder and staying away from you. Amen. My goodness, God, help me never to do a thing like that. Amen. But help me to stand and remain a friend regardless of what anybody does to me. Let me give up my life to be like this. Amen. Let's go to John chapter 12. I'm not going to hit every one of these scriptures, but I'm going to hit a few of them here. John chapter 12, or 13, sorry. John chapter 13. Verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But this shall all men know that you are my, my disciples if you have loved one for another. Here's what Brother Bram says in the beginning of Christ is the mystery of God revealed. We all know it. I've read it before. But I want to take some time in it in this context. And Brother Branham, when he's coming to the beginning, he gives instruction to the church. And, and here he is. He's, he's, this is after the seals, after the revelation. He's now going into Christ is the mystery of God revealed, which to me is the, one of the greatest revelations of all time. And in the beginning, he starts instructing the church, and this instruction is so pivotal, pivotal even at this time. He says, love one another. Above everything, love one another. No matter what the devil tries to say, now you're all one great big sweet group now, but remember my warning. See, Satan won't let that stay that way. No, sir. He'll shoot everything. If he has to bring somebody in to make his target, he'll bring some critic or unbeliever in and sit him down and cause him to fellowship with you under the quietness and things. And then he'll shoot that guy with some kind of poison stuff and he'll start through the church with it. Don't you take sides with it. Don't you have nothing to do with anything else. You stay right, loving, and sweet and kind to one another. Pray for that man that he'll be saved too or that woman or ever who it is just pray for them and stick one with another. And stay with your pastor. See, he's the shepherd, and you give him respects, he'll lead you through because he's ordained of God to do so. Now, do you remember that? The enemy will come. And when he does, just cling that much closer together. Amen. Will the enemy come? Yeah. Brother Ram said he would. You know, we think sometimes we're watching, waiting for the enemy to come and not realizing he's coming all the time. He's probing every avenue. He's, he's jiggling every door to see if there's a window cracked and not. He's probing every one of our lives trying to find an inlet. So it's not like we'll sit here and, and wait for him to come. He's coming. He's constantly coming. He's constantly waiting for an advantage. Amen. To move in and work something. Amen. But Brother Bram's telling us what to do. Amen. Don't take sides. Don't begin to talk. Don't discredit. You just stay sweet, loving, and kind. That's the secret. He's giving us the secret, but the secret is death to self. And you know what happens? The first time we start seeing something like this take place, all of a sudden, we want to outsmart the devil. We want to find out, and we want to counteract this, counteracting this. Now, they're bringing this in, and they're starting a clannish thing here, and they're whispering a secret over here. Now, I've got to counteract that, and I've got to move into this, and I... And Brother Bam told us the only thing to do is lay down your life and forget about it. Don't try to preserve yourself. Don't try to save yourself. Just be sweet, loving, and kind. Amen. I tell you, I've failed so many times at protecting myself, I've given up the job. It's better just to surrender and say, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. You save me. You defend me. You protect me. You preserve us. I can't protect myself. So when the enemy will come, and when he does, just cling that much closer together. And the one that the devil is using for an enemy will either get out or come in and be one of you. That's all. Don't never clan among one or talk and make yourself clannish. We are one. I couldn't say left hand. I'm mad at you. See, this happens so many times in families. It happens in churches. It happens in workplaces. Something just gets stirred up, and all of a sudden, the little group starts to talk to one another, and they've got the problems of everybody else in the workplace figured out. That's what Brother Bram's talking about. Don't do that, amen? 
We're all one. We're not going to clan up. We're not going to draw aside. We're not going to treat anybody indifferent. We're not going to try. Brother Bam said the one who the devil shoots with poison and goes through the church, you're not to try to push him out. You're to draw him in. That's what he said. Don't ever clan among or talk and make yourself clannish. We are one. I couldn't say, left hand, I'm mad at you. I'm going to take you away because you're not my not a right hand, he's my left hand. I want him to stay there. Even the little tip of my finger, I want to stay right there. Every little part of my body stay right there. And God wants us as a body of believers to stay right exactly with one another, right at with one another. You find out sometimes there'll be something to rise up between one family and another family. Little misunderstanding, a little misinterpretation of something that happened, and all of a sudden, well, I'll say Cold War because we're Christians, we don't break out in the full blown open war. Is that right? We don't yell and scream and call each other names, but Cold War sets in. Because one family got offended at something another family did, or misinterpreted, or misjudged a situation, and all of a sudden, they. You know what we're supposed to do in that situation? Get that much closer together. Come together and don't let the devil. And most of the time you're going to find out that it's an absolute 100% misunderstanding. And if it's not, and a brother did you wrong, Brother Bram said, forget about it, never mention it, just love him anyways. So either you can take this notion, either they didn't know what they were doing and I misunderstand the situation, or they knew exactly what they were doing, but my action has to be the same either way. So then it comes down to the fact that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they did it intentionally or it doesn't matter if they did it inadvertently. My reaction must be the same reaction. See, if we can do this in our families and we can do this in the church and we can do this in our marriages and with our friendships, amen, you're going to find that we're going to close the doors to the devil where he doesn't have easy access to slip in and cause disruption. Now he goes on, he says, now you got tapes on that. You got tapes on what we believe. You got tapes on discipline in the church, how we behave ourselves in the church of God, how we got to come here together and sit together in heavenly places. Don't stay home. If God's in your heart, you can't hardly wait for them doors to open out yonder to get in here to fellowship with your brothers. If you don't, don't feel that way, then I tell you, it's time you got to pray. Because we're in the last days where the Bible exhorted us to much more as we see that day approaching, to love one another with Christian love and divine love to assemble ourselves together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and love one another. This will all men know you are my disciples when you have love one for another. That's right. Stay right together. If the brother, you think he's a little wrong, or the sister, say, Lord, don't let me never have the root of bitterness spring up because it'll affect him and it'll take the Christ right out of my life. I'm going to repeat that because that is so profound. The brother, if you think he's a little wrong, now listen, you're going to think a brother's a little wrong or a sister. If it hasn't happened today, it may happen tomorrow or next week because we're human beings and we're all still making mistakes and we're all misinterpreting one another and you're going to think your brother's wrong. So what do I do? This, he says, you pray. You say, Lord, don't let me never have the root of bitterness spring up because it'll affect him my brother or sister, and it'll take Christ right out of my life. Why? Because Christ is not going to inhabit the heart that's full of bitterness. It's not a welcome place for him. He said that poison acids of malice and jealousy and hatred that will just take the Holy Spirit right away from you. It will run him from the tabernacle here. It'll kill the spirit of God or drive it away from here, hurt your pastor. It'll do everything. See, don't you do that. You just wax that much closer together, draw up, take the buckle as the brother testified, a minister here the other night, about having a buckle, seeing it in a vision. That buckle's on the whole armor of God. Just pull her on, tighten up, move right up close to one another, love one another anyhow, Talk nice about one another, say nice things about one another, and then God will bless you. I want God to bless me. I want the blessings of God to be heaped upon me. And you say, Hi, you doing? oh my goodness. They asked Brother Brennan one time, we'll get to that quote in a minute. He says, how can you let people say such evil things about you? And he says, you don't live for yourself. 
That's how you do it. You don't live for yourself. Praise God. I want to read two scriptures out of Proverbs. Proverbs. Let's go back to Proverbs and start in Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, 28. It says, a forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth cheap friends. What Brother Branham telling us is just not his opinion. He's speaking straight scripture. To begin to talk and to say, did you know what that one did? And did you hear? And I mentioned this before, but, but I'll tell you. I mean, it, I just like to expose the enemy. When somebody comes and says, did you hear what's going on in such and such family? I'm only telling you so you can pray. I'm telling you, I don't believe that statement one drop. I don't believe it. They're using that a religious mask to gossip. gossip. Yeah, yeah. I'm only telling you so you can pray. Why do you have to tell me to pray? You pray. Do you not believe God hears you when you pray? And why do you have to tell me all the details if you want me to pray? Why can't you say, just pray for this family? I think they're having a hard time. Why do you have to give me all the juicy details of what might be going wrong? See, it's a mask for gossip. And that's the problem because just as soon as you go and repeat it and you don't have the details right, and one tells another one so that they can pray, and one tells another one so they can pray, pretty rarely you find out that nobody's praying, but everybody's relaying what we need to pray about. And the prayer request gets more lip service than the actual prayer for the need. Help us, God. Help us. And we're, we're going to read some more. Let's go to Proverbs 17, 9. I, I, I mean, I got ahead of my scripture, but praise God anyhow. Proverbs 17, 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Praise be to God. Let's go over to Ephesians. We are not here to expose each other's flaws. We are here to cover for one another and love each other. That's why I think the symbology of feet washing is so important. Because as we wash one another's feet, you realize that in in, in that day, when they would go to the bath, there was communal bathhouses, and they would go to the bathhouse, and they would be cleaned. And this is what Jesus is saying, amen, because he told them they're clean by the word that I've spoken unto you. And he says, then when he comes to the Last Supper, he says, you are clean, but not all, amen, just saving your feet. And what he's referring to is the communal bathhouse where they would go and they would get clean, and then they would come back to their apartment or to the house or wherever they're staying, and on the way back, they would pick up some dust or dirt on the feet. They've been cleansed, but in their journey through the world, they picked up a little bit of dirt. And now Jesus was going to kneel down and wash that little bit of dirt from, by transgressing the world, uh, by not transgressing, what am I trying to say? Traveling through the world. So he washes that bit off him, and, and he says, you're clean. He already told him, you're clean by the word I've spoken unto you. Amen. He already says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. They are already clean, but there's a journey in life where we pick up dirt along the way. And Jesus come to wash that off his disciples. And then he says, you wash each other. I'm not here to criticize your dirty feet. My job is to get down and take your dirt with my own hands and wash it off of you, amen, to help you as my brother, and you come and wash my feet. So when we have feet washing, it's not just a tradition. It's not we come once a month, we, then, and we don't come begrudgingly, amen. It's symbolic of what we're supposed to be living on a daily basis. I'm not here to take pictures of your feet, amen, and post them on the internet and see my brother, he stepped in something there. Better if I just say, hey, brother, I think you might have stepped in something. Come here, let me wash your feet. He said, like I said, these things aren't profound, but they're profound. They're simple, but they're the stumbling stones. They're the easy things, but it's the place we're failing in. But I don't think we're meant to fail forever. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. 
He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I love when he says, forgive one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And the question is, how did God forgive me? Did he, give, did he forgive me before I asked him to or after? Did he forgive me when I was clean or when I was dirty? Did he forgive me when I come back and said, forgive me, or did he forgive me before I ever asked? And we're supposed to forgive one another the same way God has forgiven us. Amen. For Christ's sake. So can I, for Christ's sake, forgive you? Sure. If God, for Christ's sake, can forgive me, then I, for Christ's sake, can forgive you the same way he forgave me. And did, and did God ever ask you to pay for your wrongs? No, Jesus paid for your wrongs, so why would I ask you to pay for your wrong against me? I should forgive you the same way I've been forgiven. If I've been freely forgiven, I should freely forgive. And I shouldn't demand that you meet my requirements for forgiveness and you pay back and you make it right. Say, who would ever say that? It's exactly what you say when you say, well, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget it. And I can't know that I can be a friend like that again and blah, 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 blah. What you're doing is still holding somebody in contempt and God never forgave you that way. Praise God. So when Paul says, I press toward the mark of the high calling, it's a high calling. But it's the calling for the elect in this age. Remember Peter asked Jesus, said, how many times should I forgive my brother when he's offended me? We learned this as a child, seven times, no, seven, what did he say, until 70 times seven. My goodness, I can't count that high without a recording device. I would forget if you made 490 times or not. And that's the point. The point is I'm not supposed to hold an offense against anyone. I'm supposed to forgive. I'm not supposed to hold a grudge. I'm not supposed to hold bitterness. I'm not supposed to remember the faults. I'm not supposed to hold on to those things. I'm not supposed to repeat it or speak about it. But if I seek love, I'm to cover a transgression, not to expose it. Brother Bram said in 1958 in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said, and there's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with any of the members. Brother Bram said he was going around fixing up little fusses that had been in the church. He mentions it at a couple places in the same area in 1958, towards the end of 1958. And he said, there's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with any of the members. So that's an amazing statement that he comes and makes because there was little fusses he had to go straighten up. But he said there was nothing wrong with any of the members. They're everyone fine men and women if they could just realize that that's the devil gets between the people. That's exactly right. It's not the people. If you can let a brother see that, then he won't hold enmity against the other fellow. He'll feel bad. He'll feel like, well, that's, I feel sorry for my brother. See, if he did do wrong, why, it wasn't the brother. It was the devil that did that. You say, well, this guy did a certain, certain thing. Your brother didn't do that. Your sister didn't do that. That was the devil got into them that did it. So don't blame the brother, the sister. Blame the devil. That's the one who caused it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And Brother Ben said, if you can get somebody to realize this, they won't have enmity, but they'll feel sorry. If you can get to the place where somebody actually says something against you, I mean, they said something wrong, and they said something hurtful, and they shouldn't have said it. They misunderstood a situation. They repeated something wrong. If you can get to the place to recognize this is a tactic of the devil, and I'm not going to fall so easily to the devil's wiles, but I realize that my brother was just a tool in the devil's hands. It wasn't him. That brother loves me. How do you know that brother loves you? Because if he loves Christ, he loves me. He can't help it. Sometimes we've got to fly a little higher on eagle's wings and have eagle vision and get out of the carnal and stop with all the offense and the hurt and he said and she said and fly a little higher and find out who's moving the chess pieces. And you realize, now I feel sorry for my brother. And you know why I feel sorry for my brother? Because I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to let it go. And I'm never going to mention it. But someday I know that brother's going to feel sorry for what he did. 
And now I feel for him with compassion. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I don't want him to get in trouble. I don't want God to spank him. I don't want lightning to fall on him. I don't want to get in a car accident on the way to work. I really want to forgive him and let him go and ask God to forgive him and let him go and realize my brother didn't mean to, and I know someday he'll be sorry for that. And when that day comes, I know what it's like because I've been sorry for things I did wrong. And I know how horrible it is and how bad you feel and how shamed you are and how you, how, how you feel like you failed God and your brother. And I know that my brother's going to go down that same road and I'm feeling sorry for him now. See, you realize I'm getting the, I'm, I'm getting the, 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 the pity off of myself. And I'm turning it outward and saying, God help my brother. He didn't mean to do that, my sister. You know, what... Let's say that you assume that they didn't mean to, but really they did. How will it hurt you to assume that they did? They didn't? I would rather be found in error assuming my brother and sister didn't mean to than always in error assuming they did. Well, I just don't want to be a fool. I don't want to be taken for a fool. I'd rather be taken for a fool than actually act like a fool. I'd rather be taken for a foolish, childish, doesn't understand what's going on around him. Uh, Brother Chad just doesn't get it. I'd rather be in that position than be the one who's wise and understand, I see what you're doing, you're manipulating, you're, and I'm calling it out, and I'm wrong half the time. Then you heap shame and foolishness upon yourself. Say, God, help us. We've got to recognize that these are the tactics of the enemy, not tactics of my brother and sister. Proverbs 10.12, I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 10.12 says, Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. Praise God. While we're in Ephesians, let's jump over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.22. The things that we're talking about, this is the church I want to be a part of. Amen. The church that can apply the principles that Brother Branham gave us, the scripture gave us, the example of Jesus Christ. That, and that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of friend I want to be to you. And that's the kind of friend I want to have. That's the kind of church I want to go to. That's the kind of family I want. That's the kind of marriage I want. This is what we want. In 1 Peter 1, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, Unto unfeigned, that means not pretentious or not fake, genuine. Unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. That means intensely. How are we supposed to love each other without pretense, not faking? We're not supposed to fake it. And if you got to that place where you're having to fake it, it's time to get on your knees and say, God, get me to the place where I'm not faking it with this brother or sister. Because you got to be real, and God knows when you're real, and most of the time the other people know when you're real too. This isn't about being pretentious. This is not about mockery. This is not about playing a role and acting out a part that you don't genuinely believe. But it's about realizing I have ought against this brother, I have ought against this sister, and I need God to take this out of my heart because it'll, it'll hurt them and it'll take the Christ right out of my life. It's more serious sometimes than we, we really think about. We, we think about sometimes the, the things we got to watch out for, the big, the big blazing sin. No, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. But this is the fellowship I want to be in. This is the fellowship I want to give. This is the kind of brother I want to be. And I, I know I failed you all uh, probably a thousand times in this, but I'm telling you, this is the brother I want to be. And these are the brethren I want you to be. I want to dwell in, brothers, in a fellowship of brothers and sisters who have this as their greatest desire. Amen. Let's go to John 15. Now, I just want to, I started here and I want to get down to the real heart of this again. John chapter 15, verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, 
Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, Jesus is telling us, this is my commandment to you. We know when we read, no greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We know that he is going to demonstrate that. He is going to act it out, and we're going to watch that happen in Jesus Christ. But he didn't just say, I'm going to do this. He was telling us to do this. This wasn't a commandment for him, although he would flesh it out and demonstrate it. This was a commandment for you and I. Let's read it again. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That means the same way. Love one another the same way I loved you. Then he goes on to say, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If we're going to love one another the same way he loved us, then we are going to have to lay down our lives for our friends. We are going, you say, am I going to go get shot, be executed? Maybe, probably not. But Jesus gave up his life in so many other ways. Brother Bram said he had a right to a home. He had a right to a wife. He wanted to live with his disciples. He didn't want to leave, but he gave up all of his rights because of the love he had for the brethren in obedience to the Father. He lost his reputation, his glory, everything. He gave it all up because he loved me. He allowed vile men to spit in his face. He didn't do anything about it. He allowed a mock kangaroo court and absolute foolishness try him with, with no good case, no clear-cut case, no agreeing witnesses. It was a mockery, and he didn't do anything to defend himself. He didn't, he didn't chide anybody. He didn't defend himself. He didn't protect himself. He didn't protect his reputation. He didn't do anything. And why did he do that? He did that for me. And he asked me to love you the same way he loved me. You know, sometimes we separate friendship. We, we saw here David's act of friendship was rejected because of suspicion. They misinterpreted what he wanted, and they rejected it, and they created a big mess. Sometimes there's fear that causes us to break relations. We're fear somebody's not being genuine or fear that we're going to lose our reputation. Sometimes our friends shame us because of their failure. And we distance ourselves from them. That's wrong. We do that to family members sometimes. They shame us, so we distance ourselves from them. That is not how Jesus loved me. Have I shamed him? Yes. Have I brought a reproach against his name? Yes. Sometimes we'll be ashamed of one another. Sometimes you'll be ashamed maybe of your spouse, maybe you'll be ashamed of one of your children. Maybe a child will be ashamed of their parent. That's no time to break friendship and save your reputation and pull away. That's not how Jesus loved me. What is that all about anyways? It's about pride. It comes down to rank, nasty pride. That I don't want to fellowship with a brother anymore because that brother made a big mistake and I don't want to look like I'm associated with that. I don't want people to... Lord Jesus, help us. And we've done it and put religious labels on top of it. I don't want to be that kind of friend. I don't want to be the kind of friend that never calls when something bad happens, but only calls when it's good. That's not how Jesus loved his disciples. And that's not how I want to love you. And that's not how I want you to love me. Because none of us are going to make it perfect. And we're not all going to make it look good. But I'm not, I don't want to pull away from you because you make a mistake. And I don't want you to pull away from me because I make a mistake. 
but I want us to love one another. And no greater love has any man than this, that he lays down his life for a friend. Can we give up our reputation for each other? Can we give up our reputation for our spouses? Can we give up our reputation for our children? Say, God, help me. Sometimes we separate friendship for envy. Because a brother has a position or he's got more attention or something. And, and we don't realize it, but we begin to pull away. And because it's envy, that comes right back to the same old nasty pride. But greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his brother. If my brother gets something, he gets rewarded somehow by God, or he receives a gift, or he gets a position, I want to be happy for him. I want him to go higher than me. I want him to have more than I have. I want that kind of love. So many things that this pride and fear does. Causes us to try to preserve ourselves save our reputation, we become envious, we become jealous, we become suspicious. That's not pure love. That's all self. And that's what we're trying to do is die. I've been given life. I've been given breath in and out of my lungs. I've been given a life in this dimension so that I can by my own choice die. I've been given an existence in this life so that I, by my own choosing, can choose to die. I can die a thousand different ways. I can die thousands of different times. I can die when somebody mocks me. I can die when somebody criticizes. I can die when somebody questions me. I can die when somebody misunderstands me. I can die when somebody falsely accuses me. I can die. We get thousands of opportunities to die. This isn't a one-time death. This is a dying out to self. And God is going to make sure that as an iron sharpeneth iron, so does a friend sharpeneth the countenance of his friend, that sometimes there's going to be some rubbing so that you and I can die. There's going to be some mistakes so that you and I can die. There's going to be things that don't always go right, but things that can go wrong so that you and I can die. I say, God, help me die to all this self that I'm so sick of. That's why, friends, when you get to looking at this subject, when you really get to looking at all of these subjects and the depth of it and the reality of what we've been called to, to actually live the life of Jesus Christ in this flesh, when you look at it, then you realize, without him, I'm finished. If it's not his spirit living in me, if I don't surrender and give up myself and keep giving myself to him, keep receiving his word and letting it strip me, I'm finished. And that's why I tell you that I'm not, I, I'm not dreading the day that I pass out of this life, either through a translation or through death. I'm looking forward to it. Praise God. I want to read this one more quote as we close. It's, that message, it's the message that day on Calvary. I've been listening to that message. I absolutely have been loving this message. It says, now, what must we do? Now, the first thing that I want to say is Jesus never lived for himself. His life was spent for others. That's perfectly eternal life. When you say you go to church and you do good things, that's fine. But when you live your life to yourself, you have an eternal life. Eternal life is living for others. It proved it when he came in the Lamb of God. He lived and had eternal life because he did not live for himself. He lived for others. And you receive eternal life by receiving that day. And you don't live for yourself no more. You live for others. Someone said, how can you stand and let anybody call you such bad names? You don't live for yourself. You live for others, that you might redeem that man. You become sons, and the trouble of it is the church has forgot they were sons. You are sons. You're taking Christ's place. You are sons, so don't live for yourself. Live for others. So, well, Brother Random, I can live for this brother because he sure is a nice man. That's not it. Live for that man who hates you. Live for that person who'd kill you if they could. That's what they'd done to him. They killed him, and he died that he might save them. That's eternal life. When you get that's in your bosom, you're facing heaven then. But you sacrifice your own things. Give them up like the sheep gives its wool. You look on towards Calvary. If we ever, if we ever find ourselves in a spot where we're offended. Have you ever been offended? I've been offended recently. I won't tell you how recently, but very recently. And you realize the only way you can feel offense is if you still have self. 
That's the only way you can feel an offense. So the minute you feel that offense, you've got to start judging that and say, why am I offended? Right. Somebody stepped on my toes. They said something they shouldn't have. I, well, you know what? God bless them anyhow. God bless them anyhow. I want, I want to look to Calvary and take that example. When we start struggling with these things, what we need to do is look to Calvary. And look at what Jesus went through leading up to Calvary, his earthly journey leading to Calvary and the death itself. And that's how he wants me to love others. Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. Have you ever been contentious, that means argumentative, and felt justified? Like somebody had to tell them. The Bible says only by pride cometh contention. Where there's no pride, there's no contention. And I want to ask you too, how many people have you told off that they changed their mind and it changed their life? All you did was make yourself feel better because you got a little domination. You got to give them a piece of your mind. I'd rather give them a piece of the mind of Christ than a piece of my mind. I'd rather give them a demonstration of self-sacrifice and true love than self-love and pride because only by pride cometh contention. Praise God. He said, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He said, I love you. Don't forget the commandments of God to you, little children. Love one another. Love everybody, right or wrong, sinner or saint. Yeah. Now we just took it outside the church. Right. Uh -oh. I want to read that again. Don't forget the commandments of God to you, little children. Love one another. Love everybody, right or wrong, sinner or saint. Right. Love them anyhow. If you don't, then pray God to help you. Because God loved the sinner and the nature of God is in you. If the man is wrong, love him anyhow. Don't partake of his sin. See, don't partake of his sin, but in sweetness, not in sourness, and rebuke, in sweetness, tell him of the hope of life that rests within you through Jesus Christ being revealed to you by the Holy Ghost. Brother Ben tells us, he said, live humble. This is in 1965, trying to do God a service. Live humble, live loving, love one another. Don't never get nothing among you. If you see something coming up in your heart against somebody, get it out of there right then. Don't let it fester. Don't act upon it. But get on your knees and say, God, I need your help. Because you know what? You're never going to be able just to wish it away. If, it's not, if there's something that comes up in your heart, if there's an offense or you feel like something was unjust or something happened and it needs to be made right, and you feel that coming up in your heart, that ought against somebody, amen, that's when we have to go to prayer and say, God, I'm in desperate need because this is going to cause bitterness and bitterness will destroy me and everyone around me. God, would you please root this out of my life and give me your love for that brother or sister? I need the kind of love that can be nailed to a cross, spit on, mocked, made fun of, and everybody rejected in the world, and I can say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the kind of love I need. And when we feel that offense coming or that ought, we need to get on our knees and ask God to give us that love. I want to read one more scripture together, and we'll close. Let's go to Ecclesiastes together. It's another simple one, but I, I want to read this one. Ecclesiastes, right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I want to start at verse 8. Ecclesiastes 4 and 8. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is all vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. This is a man who's all by himself. This is what his life is like. Then read verse 9. Two are better than one, 
because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warmed alone? And if one prevail against two, one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. God never intended for us to be alone. He wanted us to have friends. God never intended us to have fellowship all by ourselves because we can't get along with anybody and go off and listen to tapes and have only us and only our family because everybody else is wrong. God never wanted that. That's a miserable life according to Ecclesiastes. But God wanted us to be in fellowship, sheep of a fold. Wanted us to have somebody to lean on in time of trouble, somebody that will cover for me when I need covered for so that I can cover for somebody else. God never wanted us to be alone but he wanted us to be in fellowship. God never wanted us to be friendless, but he wanted to be our friend and he wanted us to love one another. I say, praise God. I want to be this kind of friend. Let's all stand together. Musicians, if you please come. I can say this is the kind of friend I want to be to you. And if you ever see me being a different kind of friend than that, please forgive me and pray for me. And if, you, if I ever see you being a different kind of friend than this, I will do the same for you. And let's love one another. Let's encourage one another, comfort one another. Let's wash one another's feet. Let's keep the devil at bay and not become easy prey for him. Let's keep the doors closed, the windows fastened, Let's keep our fellowship secure by dying to ourselves for one another. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord Jesus, we realize we need you, Lord. We need you more every day. Father, there's so many traps laid. There's so many wiles of the devil all around us trying to ruin what you're doing trying to stop us, trying to hinder us, slow us down, turn us around. He's always trying, trying to break fellowship, trying to ruin the sweet atmosphere that you've provided, trying to break up, Lord, your presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. But, oh God, you've given us instruction. And although it may be simple, but without you, we can't do it. We need you, Lord. We need your spirit, for you were able to sacrifice yourself. You were able to lay down your life. You were able to love sacrificially. I pray, God, that you would come into each one of us and that you would give us that same love, the way that we can lay down our lives for our friends. God, help us not to be suspicious of one another, to be misunderstand each other's motives, but help us to believe the best at all times. God, help us not to speak evil of one another or spread things we shouldn't, but help us to cover transgressions, cover sin, and seek of love. God, I pray you'd help us to die to our own pride that drives all of these things so that the devil won't have a tool to work with. May we become as dead men that don't need to defend themselves or protect their reputation. But help me, Lord, to surrender myself for your children. Help me to love my brothers and sisters, my family, my wife, my friends, the way you love me. God, by this, all men shall know that we are your disciples when we have love one for another. God, I surrender to you. I confess my faults, my failures. But Lord, I'm trusting in you to bring me higher because you've exposed it in my life. And I'm surrendering to this word and recognizing that it's true. And I raise my hands to you, acknowledging that I want this to be true in my life, that I'm surrendering my life to you, and I want to die a greater death to myself, and I want you to take more portion in me. Oh, and help me to love the way you love. Thank you, Father, and I ask you bless us as we go. May we shine the light of your gospel everywhere we go, and may the reality that you've brought in this day become a living reality in our personal lives. And I thank you, God. I want to thank you right now for this fellowship. 
I thank you, Lord, for a room full of brothers and sisters that I love with all my heart. And I know they love me. Lord, I know, Lord, that in a time of trouble, they can be depended on, Lord. They would stand near. And I would do the same for them. Lord, you've blessed us. Help us not to forsake or forget what you've blessed us with. But help us to nurture it so that it'll grow. God, I thank you for this. We are a blessed people, blessed beyond measure. Help us to always recognize it and preserve it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And God bless you. Well, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so dear when one has a heartache we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear I'm so glad We'll say God bless you. I love you all. And I forgot to welcome our visitors. God bless you, Sister Joanne. Sister Joanne and Sister Elizabeth Holsap, or Rebecca Holsapple's mother and her grandmother's here as well. God bless you both. And I hope we get to see you, visit with you while you're here. Amen. God bless you. Amen. You can all be dismissed. It's been good to be here together. And I want to say from the bottom of my heart, I love you all. I love you. God bless you. Well, you may notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family. family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the doors of an orphanage, to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. And Lord,
I just want to think like you. So take me and mold me. Take me and mold me. Teach me to be still. Lead me and guide me. Show. Love